So this is the hardest challenge that any CEO or president or anybody who wants to exercise leadership might face. One of the hardest tasks of leadership is the task of transformation. If you're a CEO, if you're a president, if you're the head of an organization, a community, or a country, it is most probable that you will find yourself in a place where the current reality is not appropriate anymore. Not appropriate anymore in the sense of the continued survival of your system or organization or country or in the sense of capturing or creating opportunities for growth. So your options become more or less limited and the only thing that you will have to do and the options more or less become limited and you find yourself with no other choice but to introduce radical change into the organization or the team or the country. This radical change for the purpose of survival and growth is called transformation. The word transformation is divided into two parts, trans and formation. So what it really means is that your form would change. So it is a radical level of change. In general, change could be gradual, could be you know, incremental, step by step. But when you're talking transformation, you're talking something that transforms from a worm into a butterfly, from a losing organization into a first class organization, from loss to profitability, from focusing on one industry into focusing into on an entirely new industry. From thinking on a small level to thinking on a large level. So bottom line is we're talking about major, major, major change. So that the aspired reality, when it happens, would look to a large extent completely different than the previous reality or the current reality. So it is a fact of life when we're talking about leadership. When, if you are a CEO and a president, whether a company or a country, you might your, find yourself having to deal with this kind of challenge. And in my view, this is the hardest challenge that any CEO or president or anybody who wants to exercise leadership might face. I don't think there's anything harder than transformation. Because you're talking about people. And when you talk about people, you talk about mindset, you talk about worldviews, you talk about mentalities, you talk about the way they think, you talk about the way they perceive reality. You talk about their values, what matters most to them. You're talking about the way they conduct themselves, the way they conduct their business, the way they interact, the way they behave, the way they approach problems. So we're talking here about serious stuff, very deep, deep level of change. And because it's about people, and that's what organizations and countries are, 
you can imagine how difficult that is. Let's take a small example. Just think about the scenario of you trying to transform your partner or spouse, or your mother or father, or your siblings, or your kids. And the reason I'm using these examples is because these or those are people whom you know very well. So I'm making it easy. So imagine how challenging it is to change your spouse or your siblings or the mood in the family or the mindset that is dominant in your department or in your family or your, in your direct circle or environment. If you do that, I think you will have an idea of how difficult is the process of transformation. Now multiply that by a bigger number of people. And add to that another level of complexity is that, which is that the people we're talking about now, the 10, 20, 50, hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe millions of people, are people whom you don't know well, as well as you know your partner or your spouse or your parent or your family member. Put all that together and you can imagine how hard it is to lead the process or the challenge or the journey of transformation. It's the hardest thing, but there are times where you have no choice but to do it. It becomes either a matter of survival or it becomes a matter of losing a major, major opportunity for growth. Now, the consequences are the following. If you don't do that, you are either finished as an organization or country, or you've missed a lifetime opportunity. The positive rewards are if you succeed in doing that, then you're still in the game. You will continue and you'll survive. And in many cases, you would have positioned yourself to capture the opportunity of a lifetime. So the stakes are high. If you don't transform, it's almost disastrous. And if you transform and you succeed in doing that, and you do it properly, intelligently, then you've made it. Now, how do you lead a process of transformation? The reality of the matter is, it is actually a very complicated step. It takes time and effort and patience and some serious strategic thinking and more importantly, outstanding levels of leadership. The first thing that you have to do is to build a case. Build a case that looks at your current reality, the reality of your organization, of your family, of your team, of your department, or if it's in a country level, the reality of your country, and make a judgment or assessment of that reality. See where you are now. And carefully and clearly articulate the consequences of maintaining the same reality. If we stay like we are now, we're going to face the following consequences. In general, they're negative. On the second hand, you have to build a case of how the aspired reality would look like. So if we change, if we transform, if we do whatever is required to create a new reality and we succeed, then we'll not only survive, but we'll also be on top of things. So it's very important that you build a compelling case 
Why do you need to do that? Because the journey is going to be tough and challenging and painful and full of obstacles, surprises, failures and resistance. As I said, it's the hardest thing that you can think about when you talk about leadership or being in charge of people and organizations and countries. So you have to have a compelling case, a very solid case that you arm yourself with so that when you go on this journey, you can always go back to and present it at the right time to the right people so that you can keep the momentum and continue in your journey. The second thing they have to do is create a sense of urgency. This level of change cannot happen as a luxury. It is not a nice to have thing. You cannot ask people to radically change and transform from within their mindset, their mentality, their, the way they think, the way they approach life and problems and business, relationships, and the way they do things. You cannot ask them to do that without creating the necessary level of urgency. I'm going to use the, frame, the, the term, you have to light some fire beneath them. They have to feel that if they don't do this, they're going to burn. Because it will require that kind of energy, that kind of momentum, so that they can do what you're asking them to do. And that is to embark on a very demanding and difficult journey. So you create sense of urgency. And there are of course techniques how you do that, as there are techniques on how you build a case for what you want to do, for the process of transformation. You have to clearly define how the new culture would look like. You cannot ask people to embark on such a difficult and radical journey if you don't tell them about the destination. People climb Mount Everest and go through all the trouble because they can clearly imagine with excitement how it, f it would feel to be on top of the mountain. They would clearly imagine the impact and the thrill that they will have when they're standing on the top of the mountain and looking at the world around them from thousands of meters high up. They can clearly imagine and feel their emotions or the emotions that they will experience when they tell the story to their friends and families and communities about this remarkable challenge that they have overcome. That kind of clarity motivates people to climb Mount Everest. The analogy is not far away from the challenge of transformation. Because in some cases, transformation can be as hard and challenging as climbing Mount Everest. Therefore, you need to clearly define and articulate the new culture. They need clarity. They need to know exactly what the new reality would demand. There are no gray areas when it comes to this issue. Because what you're asking them is too much. If I ask you to give me $5 for an investment, you might do that without asking many questions. But if I ask you to give me a lot, substantial amount of money to join me in an investment, I am sure you will have a serious number of questions. Why? Because there's a lot at stake. So I need to have the necessary answers so that you know exactly what we're talking about and you're convinced and persuaded 
to make this journey and you know the roadmap for this journey. Over communication. I did not say communication, I immediately said over communication. Because I don't think in this kind of challenge, communication alone is enough. You have to over communicate. And once you felt that you've communicated enough and that the message is clear to everybody, then you're not even halfway through. Double your effort. Use multiple channels. Repeat. Become like a broken record. Repeat and repeat and repeat and say it in so many different ways. Use as many creative platforms as you can. Say it in every single opportunity. Because every person has their own way of receiving data. Every person has their own way of perceiving information and processing information. So you can't afford any kind of misunderstanding when we're talking about a challenge of this magnitude. So over communicate. It is said, and I believe so, that one of the, if I have to choose, one of the most important elements of leadership and management, I would choose easily communication as one of the top three. Because without communication, how can you connect? How can you mobilize? And what's leadership? And what's management if it does not involve mobilization? The fourth element here is to lead by example. You becoming an example. Because leadership demands trust. Being in a position of authority and exercising authority in a successful way demands trust. And trust cannot be given without authenticity and integrity. So forget it. Forget it. Don't even think about it. If you have a situation where you're asking people to transform, to change from within, to do some difficult soul searching stuff while you yourself are conducting yourself in a complete different manner that is not in line with what you're preaching you have to be not 100 percent you have to be many times 100 percent absolutely spotless in being the living example of what you're asking your people to do the moment you deviate you will completely fail because you will lose credibility it has to be in a situation a situation where people would say he's not asking us to do what he's not asking himself to do he's doing it first he's leading by example you have to tell them, do what I'm doing. You have to be the proven example that whatever you're asking them can be done. And you're already a pioneer in doing it. Relentless follow-up. Why is this important? Because remember what we're talking about. We're talking about asking people to conduct themselves in a different way, to change the way they do things, to change the way they think, they communicate, they behave. And you're asking them to go against their default nature or the default culture that they have been practicing for months and weeks and maybe even years. And in some cases, where there is a legacy, we're talking about decades. Public organizations, very old organizations, countries. We're talking history here. 
So it's very easy for people to fall back on their reflexes, on their default nature, to be trapped and be stuck in their old habits, in their old patterns of thinking and behaving. It's very easy for that to happen. That's why you need to continuously follow up and remind them of what you want from them and remind them of the urgency and represent the case to them over and over and over the argument that you had in the, in the first place and to remind them with complete clarity of what you really want from them of the new culture and how it looks like with complete encouragement so that you increase your chances that if they fell back and went back to their previous behavior they will come back again and stay on the course of change without non-stop follow-up you cannot succeed because the forces of habit the forces of the old culture that has been prevailing for a long time are too strong to be ignored they will immediately take control again and you have to be there to make sure that that does not happen use every possible tool that you have and some of the tools are introducing physical changes and what do I mean by physical changes? I used to run an organization that has multiple centers across a large geographical region, many countries, multinational. And there was a head office. And it was important that we change the culture of the entire organization, starting with the head office. the head office was placed in different locations it was in one city but different departments had offices in different buildings in different parts of the city and sometimes where let's take one single building there used to be on different floors what i'm saying there were communication was not easy Coordination was not easy. Collaboration was not easy. For many reasons. There are cultural reasons, but there were also physical reasons because it wasn't practical. What did we do? We planned to have a new head office. And in a matter of a year or two, we established a beautiful, huge headquarters. And we designed it physically in a way that will ensure that all departments are physically integrated. People would see each other. Open spaces, town hall meeting areas, open cafeterias, meeting room, glass walls. All the elements where visual and physical communication was easy. It was absolutely a case study to see how in matters, in a matter of weeks, the entire cultural element that was related to teamwork, communication and coordination completely transformed, completely. It did not require that I talk about teamwork anymore, or as much at least. It did not require that I emphasize coordination and collaboration. People just got together because physically the area was designed so that they interact, they see each other. Communication became a de facto reality. So use as many physical tools as you can. If it requires technology, use technology. If it requires redesigning space, redesign space if it requires changing processes change processes 
you have to create an entire universe that is designed to the detail to serve the purpose of establishing the new culture that you want to establish. Without the physical manifestation of this, without creating the right setting at a physical level, at a process level, at a procedural level, it will be hard to do. So use every possible tool. There will be stories of successes and failures. Definitely. Because you're talking about substantial change of important aspects of human nature. And you're talking about, or at least the way people conduct and express their human nature. And you're talking about a long journey and you're talking about groups of people. So definitely there will be successes and failures. What do you do with that? You use every success as a highlighted example. Any opportunity you have to observe a good example, a good case study, good behavior, good intervention, that demonstrates the new culture, you highlight that and you present it to everybody as an example of how things should be. The benefit goes beyond that because it further emphasizes to the entire team that it is possible because some of their colleagues have done that and that builds momentum. You use the same technique about bad examples because that can be used as a reminder to people of how not to behave, of how we're still, or they are still stuck in the old culture. They have to see living examples so that it remains fresh in their mind and so that they understand that this can become a reality. Involve as many people as you can. In fact, involve all of them at different levels. But everybody has to be involved. I'll give you a small case study. Once in one of the organizations that I was leading, we also had a challenge of transformation. And that had many facets. The transformation that we were hoping to do needed to happen at different levels. At one level, there was a resistance from a key person who didn't like changing the current status quo and going through the entire effort of creating a new reality. He was relaxed and comfortable in what, what was prevailing at the time. I made that person the project management of the change. And I publicly gave him in advance all the credit for succeeding in that change and transformation. He had no choice but to succeed. Because now it was obvious that failure would become his failure to a certain extent and success would become his success. I presented him with an opportunity to be a hero. Why did I do that? For two reasons. Number one, to overcome his objection. Number two, to involve him and make sure that he involves his team as well. Bottom line, the more you involve people, the deeper transformation will happen, the faster will happen, and the more successful it will happen. 
Having said that, of course, we're talking about people. So the more you involve people, the more problems, the more headache. But it's a reality that you will have to face anyway. Because when we talk about transformation, you could, you're talking about a complete change in the entire system. We're not talking about incremental things on the peripheries or cosmetics or partial change. Transformation is, as I said, from a worm to a butterfly. So it's a complete change. That's why you need to involve everybody. Easier said than done. But when it comes to transformation, you have no other choice. You need to hold people accountable. You can't afford that you have bad apples. And there will be bad apples. Why? Because, as I said previously, you're asking from people to do deep change, to go against their previous patterns of behaving and thinking. Change mindset, values, the way they think, the way they conduct themselves, the way they approach business. So it's hard, and some people will not do well. You can't let this pass. Because if the rest felt that it was okay for them not to apply and follow the new culture, then you've just started creating a momentum against what you're trying to do. You can't afford to do that. You have to understand that this is a long process. Of course, it all depends on the complexity of what you're trying to do. The complexity in terms of the level and depth of transformation, complexity in terms of the scale, and complexity in terms of the challenges that you're dealing with. So we're talking not months, we're talking usually three years. In the case of countries, we're talking maybe decades. Without patience, it will be very hard to maintain enough momentum until you see the entire process, this entire challenging journey, reaching the success that you want it to reach. So patience is super important. This is not a short-term thing. If you're a CEO, if you're a president and you have transformation in mind or you've been assigned to lead a process of transformation, you have to get your expectations and the expectations of people around you, especially those who have assigned you to this task, very realistic. We are talking years of consistent, non-stop push of moving forward. Persistence, persistence, persistence. Like the waves of an ocean in a storm. One wave after the other. The storm doesn't give up. It will just continue pounding. One wave after the other. Non-stop. Until all this energy of the storm passes and goes in its own way. Leadership for transformation is a story of persistence. Intellig intelligence is important. Luck is important. Techniques are important. Having the right tools are important. All of these are important. But nothing is more important than persistence. Because the moment you give up, everything will go back to as it used to be. The forces of the old culture will come back again and dominate. 
because whatever you've achieved so far, if you're in the middle of the journey, is still still shallow. You've just created a you know a very thin layer on the top. The old habits and old patterns are still deep inside, deeply rooted into the psychology and the physiology of your organization or country. So you can't afford to stop. You have to continue, continue, continue until that this thin layer that you've created at the top becomes thicker and thicker and thicker until it becomes unbreakable. Until the forces that are still lingering underneath of old habits, of bad apples, force opposition, of old patterns of behavior cannot penetrate through what you have done. And you can only do that through persistence. You cannot lead a process of transformation if you don't have the necessary power and authority. And if power and authority is delegated to you by your bosses, by your board of directors, by the parliament, by whomever is the entity that assigned you or authorized you or entrusted you or commissioned this task to you, you cannot fulfill this challenging job without their support. I have been personally and I have seen personally also, many cases where a CEO is asked to lead a process of transformation by either the shareholders or the owners or the, you know, um, constituency that assigned them this role. But when the task started, when the journey started, that power of delegation that support that was promised to make sure that this task succeed disappeared. What happened? Everything collapsed. You cannot, you cannot continue a process of transformation without having absolute buy-in, 100% passionate support by the people who have authorized you. If you are owning this, if the entire you know, structure of authority is in your hand, you're in control, then no problem. But if you have been asked to do this by a board or shareholders or the owners, you have to guarantee that that continues. It's not just you have to guarantee that it's there. You have to guarantee that that continues. Because in many cases, it starts with this, but then some way along the line, it fades away. And when it fades away, the forces of resistance to this transformation will eventually prevail because you don't have enough backing to do the necessary to keep the power and the stamina or the momentum going forward. If you're a CEO, if you're a president, and you're thinking about transformation, the first thing you have to ask your board or your parliament or your constituency or your shareholders is, are you really committed? Do you really want to do this? Are you ready to do what it takes to get what you want? Will you support me? Do you commit to the entire journey? Do you know what you're talking about? Will you be there when I come for your support? You have to ask these questions. And if you are not sure that the answer is definitely yes, and you trust the answer, then think twice before you start the process of transformation. You can do incremental change. You can do cosmetic change. You can do facelifting. You can do significant change on the peripheries. But when you talk about transformation, you cannot do that without the full, relentless, absolutely die-hide support of whomever is asking you to lead this 
journey. There will be resistance the entire way. From start to finish, there will be resistance. I want you to think of a bell curve. Think of a bell curve. The majority in the middle will be neutral because they will follow the leaders, the opinion leaders. They will follow the pioneers. These are the so-called followers. Relatively easy part. And there will be people who are as enthusiastic about transformation as you are. But there will also be people on the other extreme who are totally against what you're doing. And some of these people will be powerful. And they will be influencers. And they might influence the majority that's in the middle. So you need to have the skills, the leadership skills, so, so that you can successfully deal with the entire spectrum that is covered by this bell curve. From the people who are ready to become the spearhead of your journey of transformation, to the majority, to the people who are absolutely against, including the saboteurs, because there will be people who will actively work to sabotage your, what you will do. So all this process will require every possible skill of leadership that you can get. Because in the end, transformation, like change, but to a more extreme case, is at the heart of what leadership is all about. Unfortunately, history teaches us most cases of transformation fail. Most cases of cultural, radical cultural changes fail. Some succeed but most of them fail. That's why it requires, it requires an outstanding and remarkable level of leadership skills to manage this process. But there are situations and times where you have no choice. Even if you've reached 50%, 40%, 60% increase, even if you know, if you knew that there will be remarkable resistance, fierce resistance, you will still have to do it. In spite of this reality, there will be times where you have no choice but to embark on the process of transformation because you will be in situations where you are to be or not to be. Or there are opportunities. If you don't grab them, you're out of the game. Somebody else, your competitor, will grab them. So you have to do that. In your journey of leadership, you will face these situations. And you will have to deal with the difficulties, with the huge challenges that come with this process. And it's going to be painful. And you might regret it. And there will be setbacks. And there will be failures. And there will be maybe broken promises from people who were who promised to support you. This is all part of the process. You will have to understand that most acts of cultural transformations fail. But some of them say succeed. And when they succeed, miracles happen. At a country level, look at South Korea, look at Singapore, look at Japan after World War II, 
some shining and brilliant examples. Look at Rwanda now in Africa. Some inspiring examples of what a success in transformation would mean. At the same time, history is full of examples of attempts of transformation that end up in complete chaos. And the people who were leading them were either expelled or they were made to pay an expensive price. At the corporate level, this famous story of IBM, how it transformed from being a hardware company into being a consulting and services company. This happened through a successful process of transformation. It's a classic case study. Apple, how when Steve Jobs came back to the company, how he transformed it into what we see it now. What we're seeing now is the consequence of the successful transformation that he led. And there are other similar examples. <laughs> bottom line is sometimes in life minor adaptation is, in, is enough and sometimes you need major transformation you have no choice but to do it and that's what leadership is about when you face this task, when you face this reality when you face this challenge keep what we talked about in mind and study the dynamics of this journey as much as you can and be as prepared as you can because with what's at stake is huge for the people and the organization and the countries you're trying to transform and also for you but it's worth it because it's through transformation you get to create great things and even sometimes through transformation you guarantee your survival and your continuity.